Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Lisbon UX. My name is Paul Fonseca. I am one of the organizers and doers of this thing. Welcome, and thank you very much for coming. We're going to talk today about designing organizations, as you're probably aware, because you see the invite, and you come here, and you find the place, and you find the role, and all that. So, today we're going to have uh, three talks by three speakers, and then a discussion, a panel discussion. Um, and uh, we're going to do the three talks. It's going to last one hour for the three talks, and then we're going to do a little break so that you have a snack and have to work a little bit more, and then the panel discussion, okay? It's kind of always the same plan. Um, we're going to start today with um, Rita Ribeiro da Silva, and um, she's going to talk about um, designing through behavior, designing behavior, and uh, she's been working also with the Beta Eye, which is the place that we are, and uh, a startup incubator, and a consultancy company, and a bunch of things that they do now uh, that is new, and. Um, they have this new building, and they provided the space for us to be here today and to uh, have this cool event with you. Okay, so thank you very much to them as well. And Rita, come on in. So, hey, change agents. I am Rita, and I'm here with a personal agenda, which is to change your behavior tomorrow. And to tell you about my agenda, I need to tell you a bit about myself. So, I used to work at one of the best strategic consulting companies in the world, Boston Consulting Group, where he did a bunch of projects. Projects from strategy projects to organization projects. And about a year ago, I left to launch my own company, Scoach. I no longer do a bunch of different projects. Now I totally obsess about one thing, which is culture and how we can design it. So let me share you how I started launching Scoach. At BCG, I learned a lot about organizations through our approach to org projects. We usually distinguish between the skeleton of an organization and the nervous system. In the skeleton, we look at numbers. Numbers like the distance between the CEO and the person at the bottom of the pyramid. And in some cases, we help these companies shorten the distance so that communication flows better. Like decisions taken at the top, they travel down faster and more effectively and feedback gathered from customers or the field travels up faster and more effectively. On the other side, on the nervous system, we look at how the companies really move, like who sits at the board and where are decisions being made or what gets incentivized. And for instance, to give you an example, we sometimes see different teams working in silos. We see that very often. I don't know if you can relate. And we help these companies create the platforms for alignment and collaboration. And as you can imagine, there's much more to be told about the skeleton and the nervous system of the companies. But I want to focus on my personal journey because that was the critical factor to launch this coach. One of the most fun things about consulting is that you do a bunch of projects, like I told you, which means you get allocated to many different teams, many different managers, many different partners. And to give you an idea, I worked in nine countries, and I got the taste of five different offices. And it's important to note that BCG is a very global brand. It's a global company with global principles, procedures, global trainings, and communications people. But I sensed that across these different teams, the culture was not homogeneous. In some teams, I would be performing, but definitely not exploring my potential because I was sometimes blocked by insecurities and fear. And in other teams, I was totally unleashed, and I was adding so much value and getting a lot from it, too. So it meant that you can have the best HR in the world, you can have the best cultural intentions in the world. Your culture is in the hands of your people. The culture depends on the people around you. And so I started thinking, my aha moment. We usually have an approach to culture creation that is very top-down. So you set the vision, you set the values, you write down policies and procedures, you write down incentives, and you hope that this context that you're creating shapes the behaviors of the people. But aren't we missing something? Can't we also help influence these behaviors? So can't we complement this top-down approach by a bottom-up approach too? 
So I left BCG and I set out on this new mission to design culture bottom up to boost engagement and performance. And I needed to understand what really moves the needle. And if our goal is to have high performing teams, you can reach that by having engaged teams. And be careful because engaged teams does not mean only happy teams. It means committed, motivated teams that are in sync with the company. And so how can you get there? there the literature is vast, but very, very clear. There's a repeated pattern coming up. And that's it, that there are three big pillars. You need autonomy, which is you need to feel some control over how you work. Some people like to decide where and when they work. Some people like to not be micromanaged. You need growth because you not only need to feel competent about what you do, but you also feel like you're growing and learning. And finally, you need belonging. You need to feel safe to express your opinions without being jeopardized or judged. And you need to resonate with the purpose of the company. If you get these three, you really get an engaged team. And you get performance. And I'm not making things up. There are really successful, successful companies that base their culture on one of these pillars. And I'm going to tell you some examples. Netflix anchors their culture on autonomy. They say you can do whatever you want as long as you act responsibly and in Netflix's best interest. And to implement that culture, they hire A players and give them little training because people should know their way. And they encourage their managers to give their teams a goal and let their teams find their way to reach it. And Netflix employees, they decide when and how much vacation to take without going through HR. The example on growth is very inspiring, Microsoft. Microsoft's new CEO did a whole cultural transformation based on growth, and specifically on the growth mindset, which is the mindset that our talents are not fixed. We can grow them, we can develop them. To implement that culture, they now organize annual hackathons where employees can develop their own ideas, and potentially those ideas become products. And they can also develop leadership skills because they collaborate with other employees who want to work on those ideas. Their CEO, for instance, every month shares an email with a video about what he himself has learned on that month. And they reward employees who take on very risky projects. So you see what they're doing here? They're shifting the focus from only getting results to also learning. Because if you take on a risky project, the likelihood that you'll fail is kind of high, but they, you get rewarded nonetheless. And finally, Airbnb. Airbnb anchors their culture on belonging. And it fits with their mission of creating a world where you can belong anywhere. And to implement this, they are very transparent. You know that the minutes of every executive team meeting get shared with all employees in the world in the next 24 hours, and they have a team that is responsible in every office to, among other stuff, create events that make you feel at home, like pop-up birthday parties or baby showers. And this is all very, very inspiring. And so I'm pretty confident on this framework, but the problem is it is still dependent on the people around you. I have a friend who used to work at Netflix. He tells me he got both types of managers. He got the autonomy giving one and the micromanager. So what can we do? At Scoach, our approach is to really shape the behaviors according on your cultural vision. So what we do is we enter a relationship with a client and we understand its cultural priorities. And based on that, we challenge everyone in the team to acquire habits that match these priorities. We then reward, because it's a gamified world, we reward whoever acquires those habits and shows those behaviors. And like Paula was saying, we're currently in our second pilot here at Pete. Our first pilot had the clear goal of creating a healthy feedback culture. And in that pilot, we first challenged people to listen actively, to look at obstacles or tough news as learning opportunities. And then at some point, we challenged people to go for a coffee. But that coffee was a different coffee. It was called a coffee awareness chat. And in that very low key and short, coffee chat, you would pick a peer 
and you would ask and answer three questions. What should I continue, start, and stop doing? And you would exchange feedback in that way. And the thing is, some people dread feedback. Some people don't dread feedback, but they find it awkward to ask for feedback. Like, my boss is too busy. Why do I bother him or her with my feedback? And so sometimes people really want feedback, but they don't take that step. And with a little nudge, like a challenge, people start asking for feedback in a very easy way. Suddenly it becomes very easy, and it becomes very normal to ask for feedback. And it becomes part of the culture. And so if you talk to a better hire, I think they will tell you that right now, feedback is really part of the culture. They exchange feedback much more often. And it works so well because there was the context, but it was, there was also a bottom-up approach. You really instilled that behavior in every one of them. And you can say, okay, that's very nice, but what's in it for me? And what's with your strange agenda? And I want you to own your culture. Don't be waiting for your culture to happen to you. Make it happen. Ideally, under the values of your company. But if it's autonomy, seek your autonomy. Don't wait for your manager to hand it to you over a certain line. Think of that extra degree of freedom that you want to have and commit to it. Align with it with your manager. If it's growth, adopt a growth mindset. And if it's belonging, show your peers and managers and teams how much you appreciate them and why you appreciate them. And if your manager really fostered those behaviors in your teams, it has a good impact. Specifically, I want to leave you with a challenge. I want you to think of a growth opportunity you want to have in 2019. I'm not talking about raises or promotions, but more things like a new project or a new responsibility or more share of voice at the client. And commit to it. Negotiate it with your manager. Tell your friends on an email, writing, bring more commitment. The Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, wrote a book on the cultural transformation. And he has a quote that goes, the key to cultural change was individual empowerment. We sometimes underestimate what we can do to make things happen, and we overestimate what others need to do for us. And I leave you with that. Thank you. Next up, Laura Lorenzo. She works at Health Systems. Um, I know I knew you as a user researcher, service designer, now employee engagement design, employee experience designer. So many titles. You need to explain that. Uh, she has a longer presentation, but I think you'll you'll like it a lot. So come on up. So something about me. Well, first of all, thank you, Paulo, and thank you all for being here. Something about me is I'm from Barcelona, so bear with my accent in the English. I know. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about a new way to make the workplace work. And I will present to you three uh, mega trends that I believe will shape and will force the workplace to change and will force the human resources to rethink their role in the, in the corporations. And I will present some strategies human resources need to develop as well as some tools. And finally, I will present a specific example. But before that, just like Paula said, I work out systems. IT is an IT B2B company. We have a platform for application development, mobile and web. And I work uh, as a customer experience manager. I bring the voice of the customer internally for the people to be our services, our product improved with the voice of the customer. So pretty much this is what I'm doing. So the first mega trend, I thought, I think you most of us, you, you, you would have to think of technology as one of them. Yeah. Because I think technology is the ultimate designer. What do you think about that? And what do you mean by that? As you know, uh, technology is enable, enabling us to interact with the world in a very specific way. We are it is shaping the way we, with this omnichannel experience, we are able to do one thing in the mobile phone, then we go to any shop, and then the, the experience is a flow. But also, as any service becomes data, 
and that they this turns in O's and ones, which is the language of machine. We can really transform and design the the experience in a very particular way. I give you an example. Accenture today is working with waterworks, and they're collecting data, data of you moving. Well, not you, but the employees at Accenture. So they are tracking the heart rate, the heart rate. So if they see that you are excited, they might start thinking of you have stress. So in the mean, if we can transform the reality into data, and if this data can be processed, we can actually redesign the experience we, we are having at the workplace. This may be tricky, but I really believe that women, and I'm happy to see many women here, as the hidden gem. <laughs> and what I mean by that, if the last century mega trend was the entrance of the women at the workforce, I really believe that this mega trend for this century will be that women will fully explore their potential at the workforce. Not because I'm saying this, not because it's gender, gender gap agenda, not because of that. It's because Goldman and Sachs is saying so, and the World Economic Forum is saying so. Because those companies that are not fully exploring the capital that they have at the companies, including women, they have less revenue. Those companies that don't have women at the sea level, by the way, who in your company have a woman in the sea level? Raise your hand. Nice. Those have better results. And because of that reason, I think it's another mega trend. And finally, the word place. Place. So what is the mega trend here? I'm not seeing this still a mega trend in Europe. I think it's a weak signal still, but they really believe that is in, in, in the US and it will be globally very soon. And by that I mean that more and more the workplace, it will be the office, it will be your home. You will be a remote worker. So how companies would make possible that this invisible fabric that is culture gets to your home? How are we going to make you to be engaged? How are we going to make you to have the resources you need to flourish as a professional? Interesting question, right? It's a challenge for human resources. What are they going to do? Well, the question is this. They need to transition from a cost-oriented uh, mindset where I actually take care of the biggest fraction of cost of the company that is human talent. And consider what I already have said, human talent and capitalize that. So they become revenue oriented. They really have the best asset the company may have besides the service and the products they sell. And to do so, you need to develop four skills. The best one is business partner. What does it mean? It means to be Totally aligned with the business strategy, so you will make sure that you provide the, the people to the company that really fits those gaps. But also implies that the human resources may have all the, all the uh, conditions at the workplace for these people to flourish and give the most of their abilities, the better self at the company. Employee champion, we are seeing this more and more. And it's all, uh, we have that our systems, which is the people success. Is that people at people ops or human resources that is here, that, that is there for you to help and to listen what you need. And based on that, proactively design uh, strategies and solutions. The third one is a change I, agent. I haven't seen it here, and by here I mean Portugal, but I know every company. But the, the idea here is to develop a future thinking uh, approach where you instead of proactively uh, react in a reactive uh, manner you solve problems you proactively foresee what you want to need in six months time and this is becoming more and more important as change happens in a faster way so if you are able to anticipate what you need, that you are really really getting seated at the, at the, at the business world and then I'll be an expert which is basically the typical role that human resources does, that it, the 
of the office works and the people gets paid and everything works fine. And what so you have this disabilities to develop, which is the hidden weapon. What can you use to really implement this really well? Employee experience design. Employee experience design is nothing but using human-centered methodologies to develop the services and the products that the human resources need to be this business-oriented, revenue-oriented approach. And for those designers, be aware that employee experience design is nothing compared to customer experience design. There's a, a caveat. There's a big difference that you need to know. Customers, they are in a power, uh, in a situation of power. They decide which vendor I want to purchase what. Employees don't. And you may say, oh, software engineers can can quit for the company. The very next day, they have another. They're in another company. Correct. But would it be possible that that software engineer will pick which manager he or she wants to work with? This software engineer will be able to choose with which colleagues he wants to work with. I don't think so. So you will see here that the vulnerability, there's a, com there's a component of vulnerability and a component of fragility that doesn't exist in the customer experience because the customer choose the employee not that much. And as such, when you are working with the employee life cycle, which this is a very simplified version of it, it is important that you put this vulnerability uh, lens, and you work with uh, this concept that was developed by LinkedIn that is called Moments That Matter. When you look at the reality of the employees from this perspective, with this lens, you are able to develop experiences that really takes this vulner vulnerability component and makes it a key strategy to make the, the person when he's getting a new job, which is, by the way, one of the most vulnerable moments in the people's lives, takes that, that takes that fear out of the process and makes that this person that is trying to apply to your company brings the very best version of himself or herself. And actually, it helps to increase the performance of this talent acquisition process for both ends. You are able to create that sense that people are looking at the companies that you are really holding, you are, no, that you're getting my back, that you really are helping me, that you're caring about me, that you are there to help me out when I need it. And in our life, these are the most common that you will find in the employee life cycle. I want to talk to you about a particular one. And this is the example I bring to you, that is parenthood, particularly motherhood. Because remember, I really believe that women is one of the mega trends that we're going to experience. And I was curious about something that literature covers with thousands of papers, that is the motherhood penalty. The motherhood penalty and the cultural bias is that the case that when a, a woman becomes mother, it is um, considered because it's the main caregiver, caregiver, as the culture say that women are the caregivers of the kids, they are presumed to be less committed to their career. So I challenge the organization to really study that. Let's sort it out. Let's find out in what way motherhood, what impact is having in our women. It is positive, it is negative, it is neutral. What is that? And by the way, Let's figure out how the, uh, the motherhood journey at the workplace looks like in our company. And this is how it got started. Silence. Because it's tough. When you bring vulnerability, when you bring these topics in the light, there is something you need to build as a designer. You need to build trust. But not only with employees, but with the employer as well. And when you do that, you really will get to understand the reality. You really 
get to people share their experiences and the magic happens. So we did that. We did about leadership, about women, about uh, motherhood, about parenthood, about fatherhood. We talked about that, and it was impressive. It was impressive the intention, the attention, the interest, and it was impressive how comfortable the company felt ready to go forward and to work on this. Survey, because we are very data driven, and because it was really, really appropriate. Why? Because a survey gives you the anonym, anonym, oh my God, it's anonymous. You, may, you, you warranty that people will be hidden. You would not know who is answering what. It will be voluntary because you want people to answer and feel at ease. We are not forcing anyone. You can take the survey, you, can, you can't repeat. And you may decide not to do it. You can start it and you will finish at the end. Or you might just answer two questions. It's up to you. It's voluntary. And that means that you might not get all the data you want. And because of that, when you do the survey for employee experience, it's important that you create weak that empathy, that trust that you built at the beginning, that we did spend most. And I did it by putting pictures of real people on specific topics and, then, and using clip arts because they are more funny. They, are, they convey more emotions. And I used that in those particular questions that were tough. And it really worked. The completion rate was 100%, which was awesome. And the uh, response rate was almost 80%. So really awesome results. The goal of the survey was really understand how very driven women were at the company. What were the perceptions they hold about the combination of what are the challenges? So with the results, we were able to build the model for Juno map uh, at the workplace by natural conception and by adoption. And that is important because of differences. And we were able to build the persona intention of being a mother and career aspirations or ambitions. You remember the motherhood penalty? We found out the mothers, which includes the women that were pregnant, the women that were on maternity leave, and the women that were their, their mother already, are the most driven, driven of all in the company. The other thing is the journey map. The motherhood workplace is simple, and it's, it starts with this pinky left hand side, you will see be a mother one day which is kind of a romantic idea. One day we're going to be a mother. It will be fantastic and it will be flowers and no, no. So then when you really think of it and I want to be a mother, then you get into the considering stage. If you make the decision, say, I'm going to be a mother, then you start on the impro. In the process stage, you have touch points in green, which are specifically for the bio biological process. And the orange, which are the second, the two up here, my, closer to me, are specific for adoption. When you get pregnant or you get accepted for the adoption process, then you go to the mother to be stage, which ends when you deliver the kid or the kids, or you receive the babies. And then you enter in the mother, mother stage, which can last all your life, or you can actually got, go again to the considering, are we going for the second or for the third? twins, or you really step up in the in process because you got pregnant. Ta-da! Okay? We're able also to identify per persona where were the touch points impacted the most in well-being and career. Um, as you see, in mother, the most important was in terms of impacting career and well-being was career growth and balancing life and work. The not the mother for now, but that persona that would like to be. And it's kind of in this state of being a mother when they really, oh my God, how now they am so driven, they want to build my career, how is that gonna be how is it gonna be affecting me? What would be the impact of being a mother? How am I gonna make my life? So it's kinda of a lot of fear around here. And then we talk with managers. Managers that were men and women. It was really, really interesting because they really matched very well this part, but they didn't identify 
communicate that you are going to be my mother, understand your rights or work and ranching. So didn't got that. We didn't understand that I was create anxiety to women. And it was a really good thing because actually they, they were saying that, oh, now you're saying, now you say that I, in some cases, some women use strange ways to say that they're pregnant. And they, they thought it was kind of a, a funny thing, but it actually was the way to women to go through the emotion and the tension of sharing their personal life to someone that she might not have a lot of empathy or confidence or a connection with to ensure that she's pregnant. Another interesting thing about managers and women is that women had the sensation that being away from work, the maternity leave, for a long time would penalize her career, which for the managers makes no sense whatsoever. And that is important to know because now women can feel free to take as much as they want, which wasn't the case when I started this project. Many women mentioned, told me they didn't take the, the full extent of the maternity leave because they thought of that. But because there wasn't a conversation in the company about this, the silence made the decision for them. Maternity leave. So these are the four areas that uh, human resources need to consider. And by the four areas, I mean business partner, change agent, uh, expert administrative, champion, employee champion. These are the four ones. A good tool to do this is employee experience design. And if you do employee experience design, please be aware of this nuance that is designing for employees and designing for, for customers. Thank you. Next up, Lauren Curry, which uh, is here in Portugal, but she came all the way from uh, the UK. She's originally from Scotland, right? Um, Lauren works at uh, Noble, and Noble is a company that I think you should follow and definitely read their newsletter, at least, because it's really cool. Every Sunday, it gets there, and I like it also. Um, she's going to talk about designing culture, so come on up. So, hola. And this is my first rule, is to always flatter my audience. I trust my Portuguese friend that that says what I asked him to make it say. I don't really know what it says, but I think it worked. So you look lovely. My name is Lauren Curry. Thank you very much to Paolo for inviting me to be here tonight. Online, I'm known as Red Jotter. So for those of you who tweet, do follow me on there. Be kind, because my mum does read all my tweets. So there's two things that you should know about me before we get into the juicy stuff. And that is, I'm clearly not a local, as you can tell. So I'm from Scotland, hence my accent. So if at any point I speak too fast or you don't understand, then just make a loud noise or do a funny dance and I'll pay attention to you. And the second thing you should know is that I am very driven and motivated by making things better. So I could have stood up here and talked all night about the state of our world just now. It's very, very easy to get depressed when there's men like this making decisions that affect mothers and children and you know the, the services that make our lives work. But there are reasons for optimism everywhere we look. The world is the most peaceful it's ever been. What else? Wonder Woman is the highest grossing female directed film ever made. Uh, Iceland have made it the law to prove that they are paying their genders equally. And London Fashion Week announced that they're no longer going to use fur in their shows. So stay with me on the optimism route as we go through the rest of the evening. So I'm a designer. That is my background. I'm trained in product design. But I'm also all of these things. And something that I always try and leave with audiences that I meet around the world is this idea that we need to stop labeling each other and putting each other in boxes. Designers love this. 
designers love arguing and debating if they're a UX designer or an interface designer or an IA designer or a service designer or a product designer or, a, you know, the list goes on. And to be honest, our main skill as a designer is responding to complexity and responding to change. We be what our client needs us to be. We be what the problem we're solving needs us to be. And in order to do that, we bring all the different facets of ourselves and our skill sets. So I encourage you all to embrace all the different things that you are and try and move away from our obsession with job titles. So when I was making these slides, I had to add in a new word, um, which is very fitting after Laura's really powerful work around motherhood and that I had a baby in January. So I've not had a proper night's sleep for 7,500 hours. So please be nice to me. But that's nowhere near uh, Rita, who spoke before. I hope you don't mind me sharing. Who had a baby one month ago, which I am just absolutely in awe of, of any mother who can, who can work and make the world, challenge the world whilst, whilst raising babies. So that's really inspired me. But seriously, becoming a mother has really made me think about my role as a designer and the role and responsibility that we all have as creative people to make the world better. And this is my baby boy. Um, so something that I'm determined to do is, as he grows is to still do these, these types of talks and work around the world. And I've decided to try and crowdsource parenting advice by asking audiences to, to tweet me the best advice that you've ever had using the hashtag Dear Atlas. His name's Atlas. This is maybe a terrible idea and none of you will do it. But if some of you do, then I might, you know, not make the same mistakes that you made or learn the lessons that your grandma taught you that I can't have access to. So there he is. And what's brought me here today, a really quick summary of my journey is so I'm an entrepreneur I co-founded Snook one of the UK's leading service design agencies when I was 23 straight after university and I built up that practice over seven years serving a lot of clients and predominantly in the public sector in the UK I spent a year designing a master's program in service design and I was the director of design at an organization called Good Lab. So I have worked in this field for the last 10 years from, from various different perspectives. And the one thing that I'm here tonight to talk to you about is why the type of design that you do, whether that's UX or service design or web development or anything in between, also needs organizational design. So as Paolo said, I'm the managing director of an organization called Nobel, and we are a global change agency dedicated to making the world a better place by helping organizations make themselves a better place. And it's all of the work we do is underpinned by this truth that actually 99% of us will spend most of our lives with our colleagues and our teammates, not our babies, not our friends and our partners with our colleagues. And I believe that work as we know it isn't working. And I think that you can all probably see that too. So you probably have colleagues or friends who are burnt out, who are being bullied, who are tired, who are blaming their teammates and who potentially might be failing. You might know people or yourselves who that gets so hard that you quit and move on and you go somewhere new, yet to find all the same stuff happens again in a new organization. And in the consulting work that Nobel does, we see this in equal measure in the big FTSE 100 companies to the darlings of Silicon Valley. No organization is immune from this. But it's not organizations that are broken, it's the way that we it's the way that we work. So what I want to do now is ask you in a moment, and I know that you might not know the people round about you, which is why I did this, 
to make you talk to each other, is to tell each other a story about the type of work that you do. Any story at all. So pick someone on your left or right and tell them a story about your work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hola. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, I'd like you to raise your hands. Raise your hands if you heard a story about outputs, so like services, products, apps sites, touch points. Yep. Um, okay, raise your hand if you heard words like the column on the right. So collaborating, mediating, facilitating, hosting, curating. So you like to talk, you don't like putting your hands up. I'm getting to learn the, the Lisbon community. <laughs> All right. So we kind of had an equal 50-50 split there, but I'm going to make an assumption that most of us talk about this type of stuff. For one, because it's easier to understand and it's easier to describe and it's more tangible. And as designers, most of us have a craft. We have a depth and a craft that allows us to make things that don't exist real. The words on the on the right are much more intangible. And I think that the design community needs to shift its attention away from outputs and into activities. We need to start realizing that our materiality, the things that we design with, are no longer pixels and touch points. They are relationships and empathy. They are the invisible stuff that holds organizations together. So rather than obsessing over tools and processes, which I think we rightly did for a long time, it's now time to obsess over behaviors and mindsets. So next question is, I want you to talk to somebody different now over your other shoulder or the other way in a moment. Talk to each other about what it feels like to be a designer in 2018. How does it feel? A pain? A pain? Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Feels hard. What else? Feels good. It feels exciting. Yeah. Feels important. Yeah. Feels more strategic. Excellent. So the reason that I asked that question is I know that I'm very guilty of running fast, very focused, and it's quite rare that we get an opportunity to take a step back and actually reflect on our intent and our ambition as a designer. And I know that from a, a, a really high level, if we take a step back and look at the global, you know, the, the global design community, I would love us, I would love it to feel bolder and braver. I would love to see more designers working on really hard stuff, like the society's relationship to parenting and motherhood is a great example. I'd like to see more designers trying to tackle inequality and oppression and racism and all of these things. But I really encourage, I encourage you to really be honest with yourself about what it feels like for you right now and what you want it to feel like next year and what you want it to feel like in five years. And as Rita really powerfully said, you're in charge of that. You're in control of helping make that change. 
that was supposed to be all the thoughts and feelings that we had earlier. So one of the ways that I think we're going to get there and we're going to, to change what it feels like feels like is by changing our remit. And what I mean by that is that instead of focusing on parts of the organization, specific products and specific services and projects, that we'll start to focus on the whole system that we work within. Now, very few designers to date have had organizational design and cultural design as the focus of their remit. And some of us are starting to do that. And it, I think it's very, very exciting, as somebody said, and is a significant step change in our industry. So if we do a really quick history of service design, the first phase of service design was about education, educating others through workshops and through tools, making workshops accessible, making tools open and easy to access. Then it was about helping organizations build internal design teams so that they could do this work on their own, in their own way. And now it's about designing systems and cultures that are fit for purpose. And I do want to nod to the service design network chapter that's opened in Portugal because I recognize that that's an amazing step for this country in really starting your own journey of what this country's relationship to service design is. So know that you've got a champion in London who'll be following you from afar as, as that progresses. But the reason we need to start thinking about organizational design is because it almost, it doesn't really matter how brilliant your prototype is or how shit hot your startup idea is because they will always butt up against institutional dysfunction. They'll always butt up against internal politics. And that's why we need to really start thinking about organizational design. And I love how Jason Fried from 37 Signals talks about it as your company should be your best product because it's the product that you use to make all the other products that you build. And I think as a community, we're so, we're so great at learning. We're so great at hosting hackathons or building communities around new disciplines about design thinking, service-led thinking, systems thinking, co-creation, co-design. But we spend so much time learning to ship and hack and, and build and sprint that we don't actually spend very much time on ourselves, on our team, on our teammates, on our culture. And that means that things like being busy and being exhausted, being overworked, has become a badge of honor. But actually, it should be a badge of stupidity because it is all of those things are symptoms that the way that you're working is, bro is broken and the culture that you're working within is also broken. And it's so ironic, I think, especially for, for a design community that we, we love talking about it, failure. We write whole books about how to fail well, fail fast, move fast and break things. We love to prototype, it's how we, it's how we're things. But yet, if we try to apply all those things to the ways that we work, mm -mm -mm, that's not how we do things, that doesn't work. So I want to share a couple of tools that Nobel have built to help teams get to grips with, with some of this stuff. And I do thank you, Paolo, for your note to our newsletter. I'm, I mean, I'm new to Nobel, and I am amazed how many people absolutely love our newsletter. I promise I'm not just saying this. I don't write it, but it's really great. So the team have built, uh, we built a Slack bot that is free. It integrates into your Slack, and it helps your team get better at making decisions. Now, how your team make decisions is a huge symbol of your culture. Making decisions is really easy when you can all fit around a table and share a pizza and decide. As soon as your head count grows, making decisions gets hard. Things start to get compromised, people start to get pissed off, 
And usually we swing between highest paid person decides and we'll all just do what we're told. Or we have to consult every single person that's ever worked in this organization and it's going to take 100 years. Now, there's lots of different models in between those two, and that's what this app will help you in your, will help you and your team play with. So please check it out, howdowedecide.com. If you use it, you slack us or, uh, sorry, tweet me or send us a message or whatever. We're always really keen to meet the teams who are using our tools. And another tool that we use is called the user, user manual, which as the name would suggest, it's about making a manual for you as an individual so that you can help your teammates really quickly understand what you're like to work with. Now we do this for our own internal teams and we also do it with all of our clients. And you can do it on a bit of paper or you can do it in Trello like we do. And that's not super sharp, but this question is, how can you be misunderstood? So everybody in the team fills that in. Then another question might be, how do you respond to deadlines? Or what's your preferred medium of communication? Or how do you like to get feedback? So basically, you are rapidly speeding up that learning curve that you go on when you join a new team and you're like silently and secretly trying to suss all of this out because we don't really talk about it. And you, it's there in black and white on paper. And it makes working in a group far more easier. But most importantly, none of this stuff is about making people feel awkward on purpose. It's all, the, the science is there, and we know that you're more likely to build brilliant things and to be more productive and effective if you work on your team culture. Because at the end of the day, if you change enough habits, you've changed an organization. And I have this printed out in my wall because often when we work with really, really big organizations, the complexity and the scale can be overwhelming. And I always try and remind myself that that change is actually just lots and lots of individual behavior change scaled up. But there's a reason that this stuff is really, really hard. Laura's answer was, right, this, it is hard because organizations are complex systems. And by their very nature, that means that they're very un unpredictable. So we don't know what's going to happen next. We can't make sense of them. There's no, there's no rule book for us to go, uh, to go and read. And I'm really interested in what complex systems in nature can teach us about how, how organizations work. So if we look at this flock of birds, they've never been on a training course. They've never done a user manual. There's no, there's no Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk or no manager flying above, but they are conveying really, really complex patterns of teamwork and collaboration. And I think there's lots that human teams can learn from these types of systems. So this work is from a scientist called Chris Reynolds, who in 1987, he challenged himself to figure out what rules the birds use so they can flock that way. And he built this computer program called Boyd's. So his first hypothesis was, there's probably lots and lots of rules that every Boyd follows so that they're able to operate this way. And after many, many experiments and many failed attempts, he came to the conclusion that the Boyd's have got three rules. Separation. So steer so that you don't hit each other. Alignment, stay together and go the same way. Cohesion, steer to move towards the average position. So we've got three really simple shared local rules. Don't hit stuff, go at the same speed, and go the same way. And ideally, we want our organizations to look like this. 
We want to have really simple rules and we want to have local rules that really capitalize on the knowledge of individuals. So what I would like you to do now, and if it's possible to talk to somebody you've not spoken to yet, is to share one of your favorite really simple shared and local rules. And this might be at work, it might be in your relationship, it might be in your family. And I'll share mine with you to, to kick, us, kick us off. And I borrowed mine or copied mine from Tina Ross Eisenberg, a famous uh, designer um, who, who talked about hers online. You're allowed, I'm allowed to complain about something three times and then I need to try and fix it. Yeah. So talk to each other and share your rules. So same as last time, I'd love to hear some. Who would like to who would like to share either your rule or a rule that you a rule that you heard? So don't give your opinion unless you're asked for. Anybody else like to share? Yeah. Nice. Be honest. Yes. Mm. Not to say no twice in one day. Nice. Always ask why. Excellent. Five whys. Love it. I love that one. Yeah, always tell them and always say thank you. Lovely. Thank you. for. I feel like I should write a book about all the answers that I hear all over the world. That They're so nice. So we've been playing at Nobel with thinking about what rules for organizations and teams might be. And these are the three that we've came up with. And I'd love your I'd love your feedback on these afterwards, which is steer towards your customer. So you should always be trying to reduce the distance between you and your customer, no matter where you work in the organization. And everybody in your organization should be trying to do that. Steer towards internal alignment. So your teams should be designed to make collaboration and cross-communication easy. Steer towards autonomy. So we want to make it easy for teams, regardless of position and hierarchy. We want to make it easy for them to make decisions that affect them and their work without the need for dependencies and permission. But the reason that, again, this stuff is hard and the reason that organizations like Nobel and Scotch exist is because practitioners feel powerless. Even if we know this stuff, it's very, very hard to do. Most of us spend 40% of our time managing internal politics. And none of us know what to do about it. And we imagine that the people at the top of our organization, the C-suite and the CEO in the boardroom, we imagine that they, that they don't feel that pain or they feel differently. And I'm here to tell you that they feel the exact same way. And they are also human and they are also feeling powerless against all of the stuff that we've talked about tonight. So the easiest option is just to not do anything and just to keep going. But if you're anything like me, we're all designers, we're trained to ask why, we're not good at not doing anything. We want to try and make things better because that's how we're taught. We're taught to iterate, we're taught to discover, to find, develop and deliver, and to prototype and to use play to bring other people into our process. And that's, we know that that works. Googles of the world have written books to teach other people who are not designers how to do this stuff. But yet when it comes to ways of working, 
when we try and do that differently, we're told, well, that's not really how we do things here. And if you try and do it differently, then you'll probably be told that you just, you just don't fit to our culture or it's just not working out. And I need you to really pay attention to the irony there. The irony on what we teach and what we preach and what we do when we apply that to our own selves and our own teams, most of the time it's not welcome. And that's our job to fix. Now one way that Nobel is trying to obliterate this problem into oblivion is by putting all of our tools and all of our ideas online for free. So we've We've made a library online called futureofwork.nobel.io and if you go on there you can download lots of different tools and read lots of different articles about how organisations all over the world are designing cultures that win and cultures that compete. So do go on there, do play, share your ideas. We have strong opinions but open ears. And I want to just wrap up by telling you a short story about where the name Nobel comes from. Because this question of what legacy are you building is one that stares me in the face every single day because we are named after Alfred Nobel, this man. And he was a chemist, an engineer, a physicist, and he invented dynamite. And one day his brother, died and the local newspaper published Alfred's obituary instead of his brother's. So Alfred opened the newspaper to read his own obituary which said we're saying goodbye to the man who dedicated his life trying to find new ways to kill more people faster and the newspaper called him the merchant of death. And as you can imagine that didn't make Alfred feel very good. So he had a total, a total change of heart, change of purpose, and long story short, ended up leaving his entire estate to what we all now know as the Nobel Peace Prize. And that's why we're called Nobel, because the work that we do is about helping organizations and individuals leave a legacy that will outlast them. And I want each of you to think about the legacy that you're leaving and absolutely it is uncomfortable but it's quite timely in that we're coming to the end of the year so often it's a nice excuse to have these types of conversations with ourselves and the people that we love because we know that it's not about products and services and systems it's about people and that's what I think the future of design is regardless of what d discipline of design you're from it's about creating these simple shared and local rules for your teams, for your organizations, for yourselves. And it's not going to be easy. It's taken us a long, long time to move through these stages of maturity. But I really believe in optimism as resistance. And if you can't see this very clear, this was a workshop that I ran with a group of young girls who were all under the age of 13. And this young girl was building an app and I was helping them think about their future, a product roadmap, she's 12. Um, and she said to me, which is written in the top left, I've always wanted to change the world for the better. And now that I'm 12, I know that I can definitely do that. So thank you very much for listening. It's been a pleasure and I hope we can keep in touch.